Substantially, substantially. So grab your Bibles. That's what I say at this point. I'm thinking, I'm saying that's not right. Be seated. Everybody's already sitting down. Matt. Let's all grab our Bibles tonight. Book of Colossians. Colossians chapter two tonight. Book of Colossians. Thank y'all for coming tonight. Aren't you glad? Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever, Malachi records God is saying, I am the Lord, I change not. I'm glad that the God who did all these miracles yesterday can still do them today. Amen. And he can still use us today, man. Right. Yeah, I heard it said one time, think of who you would think of the greatest Christian you know. And you know, all of us are sinners, we all fail, but whoever you would look up to as someone that God has used in your life, and you would think about them, um, what is it? realize that you have the same Holy Spirit living in you, you have the same God in you, right. the same Christ saved you, whoever you would think as the most holy Christian, the greatest Christian, the one you want to be like, you know, we try to be like Jesus with that one that taught you so much, you can be that because the same Christ that saved them, the same Holy Spirit that works in them is working in you. That's right. As we come to the book of Colossians, Paul warns the, warns the church in the city of Colossus, he warns them not to get sidetracked away from Christ. Paul's teachers But you know what? To be spiritual, these false teachers began saying, you need things other than Christ. And Paul's writing this letter. He's saying, what are you guys doing? I can't believe you're so quickly removed. And he has a call. He has a message for the Colossians. They were complete in Christ. To have a flourishing Christian life, to be ministers of the gospel, to have a successful prayer life, to grow as Christians. All they needed was European family. Who was sa who saved for years to buy tickets to sail to America? Once at sea, they carefully rationed the cheese and bread they have brought for the journey. And after three days, the boy complained to his father, Dad, I'm sick of the bread and cheese sandwiches. I'm sick of bread and cheese sandwiches. I'm not eating another one on this boat trip. There's no way. So the dad hands him, excuse me, he hands him a nickel and he says, Go down, get yourself an ice cream or something. And when the boy returned after a long time with a big smile, the dad said, What did you eat? He said, I ate three ice cream cones and a steak dinner. He said, how did you get that for one nickel? How'd you get all that? And the boy said, oh, no, the food is free. It comes with the ticket. They had saved the ticket for the boat right. came with the food. Right. But see, when we accept Jesus Christ, everything we need to grow in Christ, we already got. Right. Jesus Christ gave us everything. That's what Paul's telling these people. And him, these saved people, this church of gathered together of baptized believers, the ones that have believed in Jesus Christ, they were complete in Christ. And if you're not saved tonight, Christ will still save you. And you can have each of these things we're talking about. But he says to these Christians, and ye are in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. And we're going to stop there, pray. We'll go on from there in a minute. But let's pray. Lord, as we come to your presence tonight, great things in the lives of those around us, and great lives, thank, great things in our lives in the past. Thank you that you're still that God, and you can still do it today, Lord. Amen. Thank you for that, Lord. And there's several aren't here, Lord, different struggles, whatever they may be going through, Lord, another sickness, problems with others, Lord, whatever it may be, I'm thankful that whether we know it or not, you do know it. Right. And you have an answer, you're waiting to help them, Lord. Yeah. And Lord, I just thank you that you're in control, but I pray you just help each of us to keep our eyes on you tonight. If one hasn't taken that step of faith to believe on you as their Savior, Lord, we pray that they would be saved and spend eternity in heaven and begin a whole new Christian walk with you, Lord. Lord, help them. Help each of us. Help me as I speak. Speak to us tonight. Teach us. Just thank you so much that we are complete in you, Lord.
heat in him. These teachers were coming and they were saying, you know what, you need to follow this or that or do these different things. But Paul essentially tells them, you're complete in him, you have the complete package. Man. You know, I, I know when you um, buy a car, my 2003 Ford Escort DX2 does not have the full package. It has the most basic things, mm -hmm. but it has a sunroof, and that is a lot of I love my sunroof, right? But some cars you buy them, they have the complete package. They have Bluetooth, they have all these different gadgets. I know David was telling me he knew somebody that what, hit a remote in his car would go up to him or something. Yeah, it's crazy. Self driving cars, are the complete package. But in our Christian walk, Paul's telling this church, when you get saved, you have the complete package to be a spiritual person. Really? To grow in Christ, you have more powerful than anyone. He's in control of everything. He's the king of kings. He's the head of all principality and power. But he says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now we know in the Old Testament, God gave the covenant of circumcision, or the circumcision to Abraham to show his covenant with Abraham, that he would make of him a great nation, he would bless him, bless his family, bless those that blessed him. And the sign of that was the circumcision. Genesis says, and God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee, every man child among you shall be circumcised. And he goes on, but that was something in the Old Testament, and Paul's saying, you guys do not need to follow this Mosaic law, this law of Moses, these things God gave you in the Old Testament. You don't need to follow these because Christ took care of The physical act of circumcision brought no spiritual power to these born-again children of God. Right. See, they had Christ living in them. Nothing they could do on the outside could fix their spiritual problems. Romans 2.25 says, for circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So if you follow everything in the Old Testament, that's what Paul's saying. He says, therefore, if thy uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee? To buy the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. They're trying to keep the Old Testament law. And Paul basically is saying, guys, there's no way you can keep it. Christ already paid the sin debt for you. Amen. He's saying, for he which it, well, he goes on, it's a very confusing verse, but he goes on, he says, basically, if you're going to try to follow the law and you get circumcised to follow the law, you're God mentioned several times being circumcised spiritually, not having so much a change in your flesh, but a change in your heart. Right. That's what Jesus did for us. But even in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 10, 16, circumcised therefore the foreskin of your heart, 30 verse 6 of Deuteronomy says, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Jeremiah 4, 4 says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. Jeremiah 6, 10, Ezekiel 44, 6 and 7. We, need to be, we do not need to be circumcised to identify with Christ. Paul took Titus, he was a Gentile, and he said, But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, these other false teachers that were around Titus, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, our freedom, which we have in Christ. Objection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with He says, God, I didn't even circumcise Titus. He says, this is not something you need. Now, this verse, we read it, how does this apply to us? He says, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. God's work in us is spiritual, not physical. Right. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, it's Christ working in us. He gave us a spiritual circumcision. with him in baptism, in verse 12, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. He goes on, he starts talking about baptism, but he's not talking just about baptism. Baptism, we know, represents what God did in our heart when he died on the cross, when we believe on him. Baptism shows outwardly that we have accepted Christ as our Savior. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, that any man should boast. So Paul says here, Buried with him in baptism, with Christ in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. It's the operation of God that we believe in that saves us. Right. Showing the church what happened with them, showing them that they're followers, showing the church they're follower of Jesus. But the baptism doesn't matter. What matters is that the, you have the faith of the operation of God, knowing that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And before that, it says, and that if thou shalt be from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He says that operation. Isn't baptism, but the operation of God, that operation that God did for us, was raising Christ from the dead. And if you believe in that, that's the only thing that can get you to heaven. Right. It says in verse 13, And you being dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, physically were dead, were separated from God, spiritually were separated from God, hath he quickened, made alive again together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He says, you know what, physically, our flesh is dead Physically, he says, God made us, or spiritually, God made us alive together with him, as we talked about Sunday night. He forgave us all trespasses. He gave us new life. He gave us freedom, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The Jews that were a picture of Christ, it literally says we're going to see it's a shadow of the things to come. But he says that Christ made us free from that. Christ paid the debt, freeing us from the law, to enable us to free. To keep this law to show we love him. We serve God because he saved us and we can go to heaven with him. Amen. Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Right. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. And Romans 7, 6 says, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans 8, 3 to 6 says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of the fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the they that are of the after the flesh to mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Right. God says, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. He's teaching these, these things. And he says, God gave you freedom. That handwriting of the ordinances, that law that was written for the Jews to follow, you don't have to try to keep that. Spiritual circumcision, he worked in us spiritually. He gave us a new life represented by baptism. He freed us, but he says, and he gave us victory. Verse 15 says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in. So these principalities and these powers, God Christ triumphed over, triumphed over them. Christ was triumphant over these. Christ's victory. Jesus Christ had three victories on the cross. First, it says, having spoiled principalities and powers. Christ stripped Satan and his army of whatever weapons they held. Satan cannot harm the believer. We will not harm himself, right? We cannot lose our salvation. Satan can tempt us. We can... ...pray, as Peter did, that Satan can use his weapons against us. We'll never lose our salvation, but our fellowship with God can be ended. Right. But Jesus Christ spoiled all principalities and powers... And he made a show of them openly. He showed through his resurrection when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. It proved that Jesus Christ was who he said he was. He was the son of God. And that God was truly the God who he said he was. And that they defeated Satan. And his third victory, it says, triumphing over them. And now I thought this was interesting. Whenever a Roman general was, won a great victory on foreign soil, he took many captives and much loot and gained new territory. Buried and he rose again from the 
that he triumphed. He had this great victory over Satan. He had the great victory, the greatest victory of all time. And, Christ, and Paul says, ye are complete in him. We have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he goes on these next couple verses. We stopped right before here. And I'm, I'm going to read these. I'm going to read another passage that I hope we make them make more sense. But it says, verse 16, let no man therefore judge you. So we have the complete package in Christ. We have a spiritual work in our heart. We have what happened before, therefore, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in the voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body, by joints and bands, have nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not which are all the characteristics of using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body. He gave you everything you need to be spiritually grown and to have a walk with him. He says, you know what? He gave you all of this, so because of that, he gives three things not to do. He says, first off in verse 16, let no man therefore judge you. It meets or in drink, or in respect to the holy day of the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of the things to come. I don't know if anybody else can. Paul and Mark probably can. But you can see my shadow, right? The Old Testament, the law, was a shadow showing them who Christ would be. Now, if you had to sit and watch this shadow, the whole sermon, and that was all you got, that'd be ridiculous, right? It'd be so hard. But he says, Jesus Christ, this the law that God gave the Old Testament, he says they were a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, what's easier to see? What's easier to follow? A shadow or the body? The body is of Christ. See, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and saved us, he gave us everything we need to get to heaven, everything we need to grow in heaven. Somebody points out, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Now, I'm not pointing out in front of 100 people, but just go to you and say, hey, this is a verse I saw. And in the right spirit, in the right way, not doing it wrongfully, but in the right way, saying, hey, maybe this verse will help us. I, I need this, whatever. When someone shows us something from the Bible, we need to follow the Bible, right? We'll follow the Bible. But if we do something, we're trying to follow God, we're living, we're doing what God wants us to do according to his word, and someone says, well, you need to add this to your life, but it's not in the Bible. God says, let no man there. And beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. He goes on, he says, Let no man beguile you. Now, when Satan went up to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he beguiled you, he tricked you. She lost her reward, right? She was kicked out of the garden. He says, Let no man beguile you of your reward if you're walking with Christ. Not that you're going to lose. The fact that you just need to follow Christ. He says in worshiping, voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, you know, voluntary humility, saying, you know what? We think in, there's religions that say this, even Christian religions. They say, we can't go straight to God. We're such sinners. We're so holy. We are too low to go to Christ. And that may sound good. Yeah, we're sinners. Each of us can be horrible people. I can be a horrible person, right? But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, God says that we're to come boldly before the throne of grace. We're to go straight to God. He says, Amen. not voluntary humility. You're not too low to go to Christ. We're supposed to come to Christ. Jesus. Go to the preacher. I'm glad we don't have to go to the preacher to go to God. I don't want to have to go to someone else to go to God. And I don't want everybody else to have to go to me, right? Sound awful. Right. He says, worshiping of angels, these things, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, they didn't see this, vainly puffed up by this fleshly mind. If someone tells you, you know what, you're such a sinner, we're such sinners, we can't go straight to God, we've got to do this other thing to get to God, that's their fleshly mind. No 
only the head. You see in chapter 1, verse 18, it says, And he, Christ, is the head of the body. The church, when they're doing this, they're not holding the head. They're not going to Christ. From which all the body, by joints and bands, have nourishment ministered. When we don't go to Christ, the church isn't being ministered to. We're not being ministered to. We're not being getting nourished. And knit together increases with the increase of God. If we're not going straight to God, if I in my life say, you know what, God, I can't go straight to you. I need to find another way. Another way besides going to God, our church is not going to increase. We're not going to grow in Christ. Right. We need to increase with the increase of Christ. And he says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, we need to go straight to Christ and increase in God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Why are you brought back under made such not, taste not, handle not? which are to perish with the using, which all are perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things indeed have a show of wisdom and well worship and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He says, why would you be brought back under an extra biblical law, something that you don't have to follow? Why would you not, he said, they say, touch not, they say, taste not, they say, handle not, but these things God But, you know, the best way I, I can think of this, and this is something I really had a hard time with in Bible college, was we know we're supposed to read our Bibles, right? We know we're supposed to read the Bible, have God's Word in our heart and our lives, but everybody does it differently. Okay, so I know pastor, he listens to his Bible on his phone. I think dad reads about a chapter a day, sometimes to study for Sunday. So why someone told me when I teach a lesson in class, I'll study that lesson. But we had some professors that would do three a day and five on Sunday. We had some that would do ten a day. We had a book, and the guy said he read 27 chapters of the Bible a day. And he says, I think this is really good for you to do. Now, if somebody said they did 20 chapters a day of the Bible. Now, we know we're supposed to be reading our Bible, right? But what works for me in my Bible reading is not going to work for you. Right. See, if I do what someone else did, if I try to read 27 chapters a day, I'm going to drive myself crazy and end up just quit reading my Bible, right? I'm brought back under the enslavement of a doctrine of commandment of men. The Bible will learn more than if they would sit there and read. I know there's somebody in um, my family, they literally will drive to work listening to their Bible, and they can tell you everything they hear. They say, if I sit down and read it, I would have no idea what I just read. But if I would sit and listen to my If somebody has time to read 20 chapters a day, great. But if all you can do is read one chapter a day, putting forth the best effort you can, honestly, giving God your best, all God asks us to do is give a tendency to read, right? Just an example, reading our Bibles, we're all going to do it different. I can't say Tony's doing his Bible reading wrong or Mark or Dad. We're all going to do it different. Right. The important thing is we're reading our Bible. That's a commandment of God. It's to be in God's Word, to obey His commandments, to meditate on them. But we're all going to do that differently. We're going to read it a different way. This is what Romans 14 is talking about. Christ gave us everything. We're complete in Christ. So we need to just follow him, follow his commandments, not what. Doubtful, doubtful disputations. For everyone that believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth hurts. He says, so when you guys get together as a church, there's going to be somebody who says, you know what, we're allowed to eat everything. And somebody else who says, I'm just going to eat leaves. I'm just going to be a vegetarian and just eat worm, eat herbs, right? He says, let not him that eateth, eateth everything, despise him that eateth not. And let not So if they're both saved, it really doesn't matter who eats what, right? They're both saved. Mm -hmm. In verse 4, he says, who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or fallen. He shall be cold enough, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day, lifteth up a day, one day above another. Another esteemeth. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. If they honor a holy day, there's a holiday that they say is more important than the rest, and you have to do this sort of thing on the holiday. If they're doing it unto the Lord, not for a show, not to show me what they're doing, not to show others. 
But if they're doing it for the Lord and conviction between God and them, and he says, you need to do it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, who the Lord doth he not regard it, and he's doing it just like it. Eateth not, who the Lord he eateth not, and giveth thanks. He says, you know what? If you're honoring one day, you're doing your absolute best for God on the day that you think you set apart as the best day of the year, the most important day of the year. Or if someone says every day is the same, we need to live for God every day exactly the same. Just worry about you. Do it unto God. Keep your focus on God. If you say, you know what, there's certain diet restrictions I'm going to take, do it for God. And if someone else has a different relationship. So I just will not be able to function for like three days. My wife was picking on me about this earlier. Actually, I had something I didn't think would bother me, but I thought it might. And I was sick for a couple days. My wife's like, why did you do that? But if we don't, if we have things that we don't hurt us and not others, or we think God doesn't want us to eat this, we shouldn't put that on others. We should just right. keep that all between us and God. Verse 7 says, for no And whether we die, we die in the Lord. Whether we live there for or die, we are the Lord's. If you're saved, everything you do in the end is going to go back when you're in heaven standing before God. Amen. He said, for this to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment. spirit. We're going to answer for that. But if we do it and we try to force someone else to do it and God didn't put on their hearts and we quench the spirit by forcing someone else to do it, basically we're going to stand before God. He says in verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Right. So that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Whatever we do in our lives, we're complete in Christ. We have everything we need to be the Christians that God wants us to be. But in the end, we just need to do it for Christ because we're all going to stand before God. Amen. Verse 17 right. says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But if Tony lives his Christian life different than I live mine, we're both following the Bible. That's all that matters. He says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block for an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. See, back then there's meat sacrificed to idols all the time. There's something, somebody, it's still food, it's not going to hurt you, it's just food. But if someone would see you walking into the temple buying food, they could think you're there that could cause someone else to stumble. I heard it put this way. If you go into Speedway, you may be just getting a Gatorade. And I'm not saying to do this, but this person told me, they said, you know what? When I go to Speedway, if I have a drink, I try not to put it in the back because... You know what? There's nothing wrong with going to Speedway. But I want everybody to know when I'm walking out. I'm just walking out with Gatorade, right? I'm walking out with something else. I don't want someone to stumble. I think I'm having something else. You know, if you can't carry the Gatorade because you're walking out, don't trip on your way out. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that. The illustration they gave me, right? Don't kill yourself walking out of speedway. It says, if thy brother be. When Christ died, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But righteousness and peace and joy of the Holy Ghost. For if he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men, we as Christians we need to serve Christ in righteousness, peace, and joy. And if I'm serving Christ in righteousness, peace, and joy, Tony is, Paul is, Mark is, Pastor is, if we show up just serving God righteously with peace in our hearts and the joy of the Holy Ghost, and if someone does something different, just brush it aside. It really doesn't matter. We're all complete in Christ. We just need to follow Christ. Amen. He says in verse 19, Therefore, follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one another, one may edify another. 
for me, destroy not the work of God. If there's something small, like whether you need to sacrifice the idol or not, don't destroy the work of God over something small. Do you have a different conviction than something? Yeah. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who ate it with the fence. Now, if I don't have a problem with it, but I know it's going to trip Mark up, I shouldn't go eat meat off with idols in front of Mark, right? It's going to cause him to lose his mind. He says, It is good to eat neither flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, nor is offended, or is maimed. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Mm -hmm. So some of this message all Christian that God wants you to be. Right. We're complete in Him. He did a work in our hearts. He gave us a new life. He freed us from sin. He gave us the victory in Christ. So we need to not let others judge us, beguile us, don't be and come enslaved to something that God wouldn't, have, wouldn't want us to have anything to do with. But everything we do, we need to do it in faith. If we can do something, it happy to see that condemneth not Himself. If we have peace with God about we're reading our Bibles, we're praying, and what we're learning and live, trying to live out, if we have peace with God, that's how we need to do it. But we need to keep living for God because one day we're going to stand before Him and we'll answer to Him, not anyone else. But in our lives, if there's something that maybe no one else has a problem with, but it says, He that doubteth is damned in me because he eateth not in faith. Now, not that they lose their salvation, but quench not the Spirit, 1 Thessalonians says. If we as Christians are reading our Bibles or praying, and there's something that God's working on our heart about, about cutting out of our lives that maybe he's not working on anyone else about, we still got to live between us and God. If everyone in this room right. accepts it except God, we need to go with what God says. Right. That's how we're going to fix our country. It doesn't matter what the rest of our country says. It matters what God says. We need to right. live for God no matter what anyone else does. Amen. Daniel, when they made the law that no one was allowed to pray to anyone except King Darius, Daniel went home and you know what he did? He just kept praying like he always did. Between him and God, he just kept it consistent, just kept trying. And God's a care. You know what? Whatever we do tonight, we are complete in Christ. We need nothing more, nothing less than Christ. Amen. We have everything we need if you're saved to be the Christian that God wants you to be to walk with him. You're complete Amen. in him. Just make sure everything you're doing is for him, in him, through Amen. his power. Line up with his word. You have peace with God about it. Amen. Make sure we're living right with God. And tonight, if you say, Micah, I've never had that moment when I accepted Christ as my Savior. I, I, I know that I've sinned, that I've done things wrong with God. I'm not sure if I get to heaven. Well, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you've never made that decision to follow Christ as a believer tonight, do that tonight, and you can have everything you need to get to heaven, everything you need to be a holy Christian. You don't need to work your way to heaven. You can't. Um, Except you repent, you all likewise shall perish. If you're not going to turn away from what you're doing and turn to God, have faith in Christ that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, then that alone can get you to heaven. Anything outside of that's not going to work. Yeah, right. But if you simply place your faith in Christ, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you too can have everything you need to get to heaven, everything you need to follow God, to have peace with God. You too can be complete simply by having faith in Christ. Amen. If we confess with our mouth, if we, can, if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We need to simply believe on Christ. There is what must I be to be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you're not saved tonight, Christ did literally everything for you to be saved. Let's all stand. You say, Micah, I've never had that moment when I believed in him. I've been trying to get my way to heaven. I've been trying to follow him. Each of these things, he said, but... You can't work your way to heaven. You just have to follow Christ. But Christian, if you say, my God, I'm saved, but I feel like I'm not doing what God wants me to do, just get in his word, follow what he says to you. He made you complete. You can do anything God wants you to do. Through him. As our heads of God, as you close, you know, whatever you explain. Have faith. Whatever you do for God, trust. Just make sure your conscience is pure with God. So why is it with his word? And if God gives you peace about it, you're complete in him. He's given you everything you need to have a successful Christian life in Him by His terms of success. You say, am I good? Everyone thinks I'm doing good. Maybe there's something that me and God that no one else knows about, no one else has picked up on it. You need to take care of that. Get that out of your life.
sounded like a real Christ made you complete. He gave you everything you need to overcome that, whatever that sin, temptation, that he said in sin is evil. If you're not saying tonight, Christ paid the way for you to get to heaven, he got your cross, prayed and rose again. Simply trusting in him and he spent eternity in heaven. You need to say tonight, praise to Christ. You have everything you need to give tonight to be who he wants you to be.